Watch this. Lieutenant Governor McGeehan versus the media? It sure appeared that way during a so-called press conference this week, but that event created more questions, questions she wouldn't take from us. Free of political bias, that's what the Central District Health Board says they plan on making their social media accounts free of. And we're feeling good this Friday, thanks to Mr. Mo. Stay tuned for the 2 Mo 8. It starts right now. You're going to want to stay to the end of this show. I'll just tell you that right now. But let's start here. Some of you pointed out yesterday that we did not include coverage of the lieutenant governor's press conference that she held at a school in Ammon, Idaho yesterday. We didn't include that in the 208. And a fair question we've got from you at home. Why? I'll explain. So the lieutenant governor called a press conference this week writing on Twitter, quote, if you would like to hear the truth about our legal issues with the media, I invite you to attend our press conference on Thursday at 3 p.m. So we did. Now, the lieutenant governor referring there to her legal battle with the Idaho Press Club, a battle centered on the lieutenant governor not releasing public records. We'll have more on that in a minute, but back to why we didn't cover her event yesterday. In the opening moments of the event, McGeehan's legal counsel, a man by the name of Art McComber, he said that there would be no questions from the media after their remarks. And right there is a major issue for us. At that point, it stops becoming a press conference. And part of the job of an elected official is to answer questions at press conferences. And remember that McGeehan is also running for governor. And as it turns out, her legal counsel, Art McComber, he's also running for Idaho Attorney General. So how did we even get to this point where the lieutenant governor called an event at an elementary school which, as it turns out, was essentially to just criticize the media. And criticism's fair, let's just say that. You can criticize the media, but you need to answer questions too. In all of the situation, it does stem from the Lieutenant Governor's Education Task Force. Over the summer, the task force held four public meetings, which the Lieutenant Governor said they were necessary to, quote, protect our young people from the scourge of critical race theory, socialism, communism, and Marxism. She asked Idahoans to weigh in to send emails with their experiences, and several media outlets then filed public record requests asking to see those emails. We wanted to know what Idahoans thought about the issue. And now all this is common practice to see exactly what the public was saying. But McGeehan's office failed to release those emails to the media saying that she was trying to protect Idahoans from the media. But in August, a judge ruled that McGeehan wrongly denied journalists access to those public documents. So, McGeehan was fined $750 by the court for a bad faith violation of the Idaho Public Records Act. The judge in the case also ordered McGeehan to pay the Idaho Press Club attorney fees and court costs. It's a lot of money. Now, this is interesting because the Idaho Attorney General's office actually worked with the Lieutenant Governor on this case, but the Lieutenant Governor went on to make an independent decision to seek outside representation, which she's fully allowed to do. Now, at the event yesterday, McGeehan said that she had proof that she acted on the Attorney General's advice in her actions, implying that strongly she got bad advice from the AG. And she waved around a piece of paper yesterday at the event, one that she says was proof the, the legal advice she got from the AG's office. Well, our team that was there in Ammon, they asked her about the paper, but she said because of attorney-client privilege, she was prevented from sharing any of the info on that piece of paper or even showing it to us. Well, we wanted to know if that is true. So we asked a legal expert to explain to us more about attorney-client privilege. The attorney-client privilege is any communication from a client to a lawyer where the client is seeking uh, legal advice. Those communications would be protected from disclosure. So uh, the, the client or the lawyer would be prevented or prohibited from uh, sharing that information with the public. So, as Mr. Watkins explained there, McGeehan, as the client, she's allowed to say whatever she wants, and she does have the ability to share whatever she wants to. Only the attorney is blocked from saying something. Now, turning quickly now to another question that we got from you at home, why did the lieutenant governor hold her event at an elementary school in Ammon, Idaho? Well, the lieutenant governor says it was because it was a good backdrop, as it was talking about her education task force, the education task force, schools, hold the event at a schools. There you go. That was her explanation. But the school district says they were not made aware that she was going to be there, never mind holding a so-called press conference there. The superintendent of the school district explained all of this to us in a video statement. 
Um, I was not aware that there was a press conference scheduled there, so I reached out to the principal at Ammon, and he said that he was not aware of it either. Uh, he did have a parent that had asked to use the auditorium, and so he told the parent that they could use it, but it was uh, neither he nor I realized that it was for a press conference from the governor. And with political activities, uh, we certainly allow those uses of our facilities after school hours when they're not a disruption to school, but we do ask that anybody who would like to use our facilities, including the lieutenant governor, would please contact the school principal or the district office to make the appropriate arrangements to use those. And what in quick note to add to all of that, there is speculation that the press conference from the lieutenant governor at Ammon Elementary School, well, there's speculation it may have actually violated Idaho law because there was a mention of campaign talk, specifically with Mr. McComber, who was mentioned he's running for attorney general. Again, it's unclear if any laws were broken. We are looking into this closely. Well, the Central District Health Board met today and one of the agenda items, one of the top agenda items, the social media policy. They wanted to have a discussion about it. Well, Central District Health maintained that it wants to remain free of any political bias, and they drafted a policy that prohibits CDH from reposting elected officials. And Andrew Bartline, he's following this for us today. I know you sat in on the meeting. There was a lot going on in the meeting. It, it sounds like that the spirit of the, the law is to remain neutral here for the, the board and not show any favoritism or support for elected officials. But I guess what does the discussion look like beyond that on this policy? Yeah, the policy was generally supported, Joe. Nobody seemed to want any perceived bias on the board. Uh, additionally, with that, the discussion did kind of talk about some exceptions. When would it be allowed to, you know, retweet someone like Governor Brad Little if he's tweeting about AARP, information that's relevant to public health, uh, things of that knowledge, and uh, kind of uh, those instincts, uh, instances, rather, excuse me, uh, if it would be okay to repost that, retweet the elected official, because the district director, Russ Duke, argued in the meeting, sometimes that is necessary because that's the medium to get the information out. If we didn't repost that, there would, that information would not be coming from us. You know, it comes from their account, but back to the point of, of social media is you, you take you take information that you think is relevant and important for the community to hear about public health, public safety, and you pass that on through your own posts so that your followers, people who are following Central District Health that may not be following Valley County Commissioners, uh, would then get that information. So there's not really a, another mechanism for that, that content and that medium to get the information out. Now, discussion further tried to define who decides what qualifies as, you know, public health value. And what does that line cross where an elected official gets favoritism by a CDH social media account? Ultimately, the board agreed that there is some gray area and without a clean cut answer for every case by case basis, they decided to start debating the language of the policy. They ultimately settled on that CDH will refrain from reposting content from an elected official's social media account. So, Joe, if CDH wants to get AARP information out, that's the example they kept using. Uh, they're not going to be retweeting Governor Brad Little. They'd probably go directly to AARP specifically um, or maybe just do their own content themselves and tweet it out. It's really interesting because uh, Russ Duke's right. This is the medium that, you know, we really get a lot of our information from, especially in, in the news world, right on social media. And there really should be a discussion about, I guess, who's posting what and how is it posted. And it's something that you may not think about, but you know, from an organizational standpoint, it's a really important conversation. Yeah, and really that was their big point is they don't want any perceived bias as well. They mentioned that there have been some political problems mm -hmm. on the board in the past or perceived political issues. So they just want to make sure that they're not uh, running that line. It's Andrew Bartline reporting for us here on the 208. Andrew, thank you. Thank you, Joe.
Every Friday, we like to take a little bit of time to go through our inbox and find the questions that we may have missed from you over the last week. And there were a lot to choose from this week. So let's start with this one from Roger, who asks, quote, I've seen reports that COVID-19 is in endemic in Idaho as a result of our low vaccination rates. What does this mean for Idaho's future? Well, Roger is absolutely correct right now. 53.6% of eligible Idahoans, that's everyone over the age of 12, well, that number are fully vaccinated. Nationally, that number is just over 66%. So we are behind the national average. Now, Idaho's health officials say that COVID-19 is slowly moving from being considered a pandemic to an endemic, meaning that it will likely be something that we deal with for the rest of our lives. So you can think COVID more like the flu now during uh, in, in terms of the spread and the yearly occurrence. I don't want to compare the two, so I want to be very clear there. Now, during a meeting with the Department of Health and Welfare this past Tuesday, Dr. Stephen Nemerson, the chief clinical officer for St. Alphonsus Medical Center, he had this to say on the topic. On December 14th of 2020, I told you that that day was the D-Day in the battle against coronavirus. And sadly, today I'm here to tell you that we've lost the war, that COVID is here to stay. And the reason it is here to stay is because we cannot vaccinate enough of the public to fully eradicate the disease. And absent being able to do that and accomplish herd immunity, we now need to move into the phase of recognizing that COVID is going to be a disease to be managed for the long term future. So what does this mean for all of us here in the state of Idaho, the United States? What does this mean? Well, unfortunately, it's, it's unclear. We're all going to have to experience it together. However, as Idaho's health officials continue to reiterate, the best way to help slow the spread of the virus is to get vaccinated. They are safe and effective. More questions from you. Jim asks, what's going on with the police station in downtown on Fairview? Good question. We actually reached out to the city of Boise and Boise Police on this one. The building actually officially opened last December after a complete renovation down there. Before they were actually in that building, some officers, specifically bike officers, they had to work out of temporary spaces. But again, that new space on Fairview is now open. It's a good resource for the police department to have in downtown and a good spot away from City Hall and City Hall West. And finally, Josh asks, how much more money over time would the bond option cost versus the no bond option? And he is referring to the Boise water bond that will appear on the ballot next month. For more, you can check out our story from yesterday on our website. Now, it's part of a long term plan to expand the city's wastewater treatment capacity and replace aging infrastructure. The total cost is actually more than $900 million, but the proposal would have it be funded by a combination of $570 million bond and the rest cash. Now, Boise City Council members approved a vote last month to put the bonds on the ballot. If voters approve the bond, water renewal rates would increase about 10% or about $3.64 per month. If it fails, that rate jumps up about 53% or on an average monthly increase of $19.51 per month. And to be very clear, this isn't your water rates going up. That's a completely different thing. This is strictly about the water renewal program rates. Now you likely get a bill every other month, uh, part of that program, if you are in the Boise Sewer District. And make sure that you keep sending us your questions. Our number is right here on the screen, 208-321-5614. For those of you wondering, Mo is coming up shortly, so stay tuned. We will be back.
Just to show you some of the temperatures for tomorrow afternoon, if you're going to be tailgating, enjoying the game for later tomorrow night, starting out at uh, 1 o'clock, you can see the temperatures are already in the 60s. That's after lows will be in the 40s, so kind of chilly in the morning. But we get into the 50s between 9 to about noon, and then you can see 69 degrees there. Uh, 4 o'clock, 70 degrees, then 6 o'clock, 69. Game time temperature will be 64 degrees at 7 o'clock, okay? So keep it in mind. Uh, we have clear conditions here. It's clear over most of the northwest. That's what's coming in over our weekend. But just to let you know, there's a storm twishing, pushing to our north, and we have a low up here that will help to push a few more clouds and maybe some showers in here on Monday. That's why I have this seven-day forecast that shows you a fantastic weekend. 71 for tomorrow, 72 for Sunday. And here's the storm system. It's mainly to our north, but it shows a shower on Monday with a temperature of 57. There's Tuesday at 60. Next week, it looks pretty nice with temperatures into the 60s. Keep this in mind, though. Here's the 10-day temperature trend. So you see the low on Monday. You see those temperatures coming up. And then you see as we get down toward the weekend, we start cooling off again Sunday and Monday. I think cooling off quite a bit as we head toward the month of November. So that's your weather. Let's go back to more with co-anchors Joe and Mo, right? Joe, uh, Mo, Mo will join us shortly if you're if you're tuned in for Mo. He'll be up in a few minutes, but um, a serious story for you. On Monday, we introduced you to Sarah McDonald. She works as an ICU nurse here in Boise at St. Luke's and after a particularly difficult shift a few weeks ago, she penned a poem that has since gone viral on social media, extremely powerful. Now you can see her full story right now at KTVB.com, but the story was about the, the poem she wrote, and so many of you reached out wanting to read the poem or learn more about it. And so um, because of the, the outpouring of support, we decided that we would share the entire poem with you. So here's Sarah McDonald reading the poem that she wrote for us. I am a COVID veteran. This is a different kind of war. A war some don't believe in, a war some mock, a hoax. The trauma is real, the dying is real. Running down the halls one room after another, put your mask back on, stop pulling on lines, mitts. You have to keep your mask on. Your daughter's coming in the morning, don't you wanna see her? The goal is to keep that one alive long enough for his daughter to be here when they turn the oxygen off. Let's just get him to morning. There's that name I'll never forget, the first in a growing line. They declined for a time the use of their O2 device. I had to take it. I gave it to another more likely to survive. This one lives, that one dies. They all suffer. The look in their eyes. As they learn the rules of an unfamiliar game. From room air to nasal cannula, nasal cannula to oxy mask, non-rebreather, high flow, BiPAP, max it out. I can't breathe. I know you can't breathe. I know. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's blasting air in your face. I'll gladly take it off. Just do me a favor. Change your code status first. I have a line of people waiting for that machine if you aren't going to keep it on. I need you to change your code status first. What else can be done? Intubation is next. That look on their face. That's where we are. That look on their face. That's where you're at now. The look on their face. This machine doesn't go any higher. Intubation is next. You don't like that option. You didn't realize. None of them realize they would be so acutely aware, cognizant, oriented, at the moment facing that decision. I stand anxious, waiting. I need them to make it faster. I realize what a cruel thing my impatience in this moment is, but I need them to make it faster. I have another one crumping three doors down. I am still not able to be more places than one at any given time, much as I try. As if I wanted to share my time between two atrocious scenes. So, I want this off my face. It's blasting me. I can't breathe. Okay. I need you to understand what will happen if I take that off. No sugar coating, no lies, no time for gentle deliveries. First, you'll panic, gasping for air. You'll be agitated. You'll start pulling at lines and thrashing about like a fish out of water. In this case, a fish suffocating at the bottom of an ocean of air, surrounded by it, yet out of reach. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. The panic will hold on to you. 
mitts if we must, keep you from hurting yourself on equipment, manage self-damage, you'll struggle. You'll ask for the equipment back, but it's already been cleaned, passed on to the next. You'll grow tired, you'll thrash less, you'll stop talking, you'll shift to a soft blue hue. You'll fall asleep, so tired, just to rest. The blue will deepen. You're not done, but you're holding still. On to the next. Someone else is crashing, thrashing, pulling on lines. Take slow, deep breaths. Keep them slow. Try not to panic. Are you telling them or yourself? Try not to panic. Just take some slow, deep breaths. Stable. Back to the previous room. Agonal breathing. Sporadic. Gasp. A deeper blue. They're still alive. On to the next. On to the next. On to the next. On to the next until morning. We just have to make it till morning. We just have to make it while morning. We just have to make it still morning. We just have to make it on to the next. Oh boy, the next few minutes are going to be filled with some excitement. You may or may not have noticed, Brian has been off all of this week, but from the looks of it, you definitely noticed and you made sure to tell us about it. How about this? I can't tell you how many text messages and emails we've gotten over the last week asking, where is Brian and why don't you tell us where Brian is? So we decided to interrupt his vacation to prove that he is alive and well and that Brian will be coming back. Hey, Brian, uh, people are asking for a proof of life. They're really concerned that um, you're gone. Um, where are you? Uh, currently right now, uh, just in Hell's Kitchen. Times Square is right over there. 
and I'm looking out on beautiful New York City right now. So yes, life check, I am alive, and I'll be back in Idaho before you know it. How do we know that's not a green screen behind you and you're not at home? We come over here and we shake these trees like this and do that, and it's real. So, hi, I'm alive, I'm in New York City. I'll be home soon. Well, that's enough, Brian. <laughs> okay. We'll see you later, Brian. And that's how we left it, so we'll see if Brian talks to me when he does get back. All right, some comments here from you to end the show. This person says, Lieutenant Governor wants to protect us from the media. Are we living in a dictatorship? The media may not always be right, but it's our greatest freedom and balance of power. That from Rusty. Rusty, you make a good point. We don't care left or right or what party a politician is in. We want to ask them fair and legitimate questions on behalf of you, the people that elected them. It's very important that we get answers from elected officials on important questions, especially as we head into an election. Well, we're going to end the show here and the work week with another Feel Good Friday starring uh, our newest guest. Come here. Come here. Andrew's got him. Oh. Mo is here. Come here. Oh, yes. Live animals on TV it always works. That's the rule. So here's baby Mo. He is the unofficial mascot of the 208, and he's a little sleepy. So my friends in the production room are going to show you some lively Mo action to send us into the weekend.